Hello and welcome to CLC Kids Worship Online. I'm Jeanette and I'm the Family Ministry Director here at the Christian Life Center. And you might be watching this from the sanctuary, maybe on the big screens, or you might be out in our parking lot, or you might be at home watching this by the fire with a nice big hot cup of cocoa, wherever you are and wherever you, whatever you're doing, I'm so glad that you could be with us today for CLC Kids Worship Online. And Merry Christmas. It's just a few days away. Are you ready? <sighs> Did you join the Christmas party last week? Wasn't it a fun party with Miss Megan? And if you haven't signed up yet, we're hosting a Doe Holy Night this Tuesday, a virtual event for families to get together and make some cookies and share in the cookie making fun. And this recipe that I have for you for that is so easy. Anybody can do it, even me and we get to hear the story of the first Christmas together. So if you haven't signed up, make sure to do that on the CLC Kids website today. Now, I would love for you to come to our cookie making party, but what if someone really famous invited you to a party? Would you be pretty excited? I don't know about you, but I'd be so excited that I would have to tell everyone I know I'd take pictures to remember the, each moment, and I'd probably count down every minute right up until the party. Am I right? What would you do? Would you do the same thing? Well, in today's story, we are going to learn about some shepherds who witnessed the very first Christmas celebration ever. In our story today, it's found in the book of Luke. Now, Luke is in the New Testament, and it's one of our first four books there in what we call the Gospels. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all tell about how God sent Jesus from earth to heaven. Now, I have some questions about this story. Um, why was it that Jesus had to be born in a place where animals were kept? And why did Jesus, why did God send Jesus from heaven to earth? So let's see if we can answer those questions today. It starts off, Mary was pregnant with baby Jesus, and Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, the city of David. The ruler of the land wanted to know how many people were in his kingdom. So he made everyone travel to his hometown to be counted. They looked for a safe place to stay, but every place was full. So Mary and Joseph found a place where the animals were kept, and that is where Mary had her baby. Joseph named the baby Jesus. Mary wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. That night, some shepherds were watching their sheep out in the fields. All of a sudden, an angel stood before them, and a bright light shone around the shepherds, and they were scared. And the angel said, do not be afraid. I have good news for you. Today, a Savior, who is the Messiah and the Lord, was born for you. Go find the baby. He will be wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, many angels appeared. They praised God and said, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. <sighs> When the angels left, the shepherds hurried, hurried to find baby Jesus. They found him, and they told others about him. Everyone who heard about Jesus was surprised and amazed. Everything had happened like the angel said. Jesus was born. This was very good news. Jesus was not like other babies. Jesus is God's son. Jesus was sent from heaven to earth. Jesus loved us so much that he came to the world to rescue people from their sin. God loved us so much that he sent his son to rescue us from our sins. Can you imagine what the shepherds thought when the angels told them the good news? Our song today is about the angels who first told the shepherds the good news. Sing it out where you are, sing it loud, and I will lead the motions from the corner. Here we go. Angel. 
angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous promises and covenants throughout the Old Testament to many people, starting with Adam and Eve and the prophets and kings, that he would send a Savior. And we celebrate that this Christmas, the day that God sent a Savior, the day that God kept his promises. And that is what this December memory verse is about. Last week, we learned that Zechariah spoke these words when his son John was born to point the way to Jesus. He said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. December is almost over, but you can still get a prize for saying your memory verse. All you have to do is take a video of yourself saying it from memory and send it to me 
and I'll send you the prize. So let's practice it now. I'll leave the motions from the corner. When baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God the Son came from heaven to earth to live with his people. Even though he was God, Jesus still got hungry and took naps, and Mary probably sang to him and, and rocked him to sleep. Um, Jesus was fully God and fully man. God planned all along to send his Son to earth as a human baby. God knew his people would sin and need to be rescued. Jesus was born to rescue people from their sin. Jesus lived a sinless life on earth. He kept God's law perfectly so that one day he could take the punishment we deserve for sin. He loves us so, so much. I'm so glad that you could join us today. We have more activities for your families to do that go with today's lesson. You can find them on our CLC Kids website. You can find the link to our website on our church homepage at clcfamily.church. And the link looks just like this with the kids, CLC Kids logo. If you would like to be a part of our CLC Kids worship online, or if you would like to send me a video of you saying the memory verse from memory, send it to me at Jeanette at clcfamily.church. And I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas week, remembering that God loved us so much that he sent a Savior, and that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Merry Christmas, and see you next week.
and its splendor fills up the sky. It's the same that appeared and the wise men revered when hope was born this night. Out upon the snowy fields, there's a silent peace that heals, and it echoes the grace of our Savior's embrace because hope was born this night. Glory to God in the highest Peace on earth, goodwill toward men Let all of the world sing the chorus of All right, well, good morning, CLC family. We are so excited to have you here with us this morning so that we can worship together. At this time, I'll invite everyone, whether you're worshiping with us online, out in your car, or here in the sanctuary, to stand and join us. Joy to the world. Joy, oh, joy. 
Jesus, to you we lift 
everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Christian Life Center. We're so glad to have you guys here. My name is Christian and I'm on staff here at the CLC. Uh, if you're joining us from home, welcome here in the sanctuary. Welcome. So glad to see some faces. Uh, if you're in the parking lot, welcome. But I feel like I have to make a distinction. There are people in their cars in the parking lot, but then there are about nine or ten of you, I just counted, who are sitting out in their chairs, bundled up in the cold. Y'all really love Jesus. We are so glad that you guys are here. Welcome to the Christian Life Center. Just wanted to share a couple announcements with you guys. Real quick, if this is your first time, uh, we'd love to get to know you more. We'd love to connect with you and figure out how uh, we can make you part of the CLC family. So if you'd like, go ahead and fill out a connection card. Uh, you were handed some bulletins when you came in today, or if, maybe if you're watching online, there's actually a link at the top of the page. Uh, if you minimize the screen, don't go full screen, and it says connection card, you can click that and fill that out for us. I uh, wanted to share with you, this week is Christmas, which is crazy. I feel like yesterday was March, but here we are. It is Christmas. We're about to celebrate uh, Advent together, um, but this Thursday is Christmas Eve. We are having Christmas Eve services here at the church, and there's multiple ways that you can join us. At 5 o'clock, we're doing a live service. In here, we'll be streaming in the odd upstairs. We'll be out in the parking lot on the big screen, and you can join us online. Then at 7 o'clock, we're actually moving a 
lot of our gear outside. We're going to have the show mobile set up, and we're going to do a live service from the parking lot. We'll be restreaming the 5 p.m. service at 7 o'clock online, but you can actually join us in the parking lot, pull up in your car, and stay nice and warm. And then at 9 o'clock, we'll be restreaming the previously recorded 5 p.m. service. So if you want to join us, which we really hope you do, uh, we'd love to have you. Those are the details. You can visit clcfamily.church slash Christmas to learn more if you forget some of these details. I did also want to mention that today is actually the last it, the last service in the of the year that we are here at the Christian Life Center. Because next week, the 27th, we have this thing we're calling Home for the Holidays. Uh, in an effort to be safe, we understand a lot of people are going to be with their families on Christmas. So in an effort to create a buffer after that, in an effort to give us all some space to rest and relax, and also in an effort to thank our incredible volunteers who have been working countless hours to make these services happen this year, we're doing everything online next week. So uh, if you're watching today, you can't join us in the same manner next week. So be sure to tune in online, clcfamily.online.church, and you can join us online. It's going to be the same service. Uh, it's going to be at 9 o'clock, 1045, and 5 p.m. So make sure you don't show up here next week because you may be by yourself. And maybe someone else will show up and you can watch it in the parking lot on your phone or something. But don't show up to the building next week week. We'll be home for the holidays. I also wanted to mention this last week, uh, we had our quarterly newsletter published. Uh, usually it's just a longer newsletter with a lot more information about what is happening at the church, why it's happening at the church, and everything in between. So if you want a good picture of what 2020 will look like, Josh wrote a letter for the church. You can see all of that there. Just go to clcfamily.church slash news, and you can find that information. And I just want to, from the staff, on behalf of the staff and our volunteers here, just wish you all a very merry Merry Christmas, and welcome to week five of God with us. Thanks, Christian. I have no idea what he said. I just heard that he said the people out in the parking lot sitting out there, they love Jesus more than the people in here. Uh, that's all I heard. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I can't believe he'd say something like that. We would never say something like that out there at all. I'm glad to be with you. In just a second, we're going to pick up on God with us. Here, I'll go ahead and put up the logo, God with us. But before we get there, one of the things that Christian just told you is this is the last in-person service of the year be a lot of fun. Next week, uh, we'll be home for the holidays. Megan will be leading worship with Christian in her home. I'm going to be teaching from my home, so you'll get to judge our decor, all those kind of things. So it'll be lots and lots of fun. But since this is the last um, service in person together of the year, to me, it made sense that we would just have a quick family talk, right? So 2020 and sending up, I mean, we believe in the church as a family, right? And so you go back through the Old Testament, God establishes a couple things. The first thing he establishes is marriage, right? So God created Adam, he created Eve, he established one flesh marriage. First institution he created, right? And then after that, you see after that institution, Adam and Eve have some children, and so the very first thing you see God implement is marriage. Second thing you see him implement is family. Then you read through the whole Old Testament, and it just goes haywire. In fact, real soon after God implements marriage, there's some messes going on in the marriage, right? Lots of blaming, lots of mess. And then God institutes families, and boy, is there some mess. One brother kills the other brother, right? And so the whole Old Testament is God created this family and this marriage for real human growth and development. This just gets broken. And yet, what God does then is he creates another institution. It's called the church. And what the church does is it comes and it restores marriage and family, right? He gives us a new understanding of what family can look like, and it no longer has to do with your blood relatives. It has to do with your spiritual family, so that's why we talk about it here a lot. CLC family, that's why the website, clcfamily.church. We're a family, and if we're a family, you should know what's going on in the family business. And let me talk to you real quick about some money, and I'm going to draw pictures, and hear me, hear me. Um, if you're online, out in the parking lot right here, in the service. I mean, I know you guys love Jesus. I'm not sure about the ones in the parking lot. Uh, so, um, I, I'm just joking. I, I saw the people out there. I think most of them do. Um, so, but, and, but while I'm talking about money, please don't think there's some big ask end of the year that we're going, hey, you got to give some money. You got to rally the troops. Please don't hear this with any manipulation or coercion. There is not going to be a single ask of you in this. Okay? I'm just want to give you the information. And so, draw you a picture. This is XY chart, right? So, here we go. What we have here is uh, for 2020. I don't know if y'all know, but it's been a little bit of an interesting year this year. Uh, in uh, 2020, we established a budget of $1.5 million. That's the budget, $1.5 million. And basically what we do is we take uh, the previous year's uh, giving and offering, and we go, what can we 
you know, expect with good stewardship to kind of predict what next year's budget's going to be. It's all the forecasting, and as you understand, we understand 2020 took us for a little bit of a ride. And so if 1.5 looks something like this, okay, you know, each month you've add that up, you got a certain amount, 120, whatever that is, each month that you got to get to. Um, let me, so when we started, and so you got January here, okay, December here, as we've just kind of been working through, right here at the beginning, we're doing pretty good right here on it, right? Budget going good, it's doing good. I don't know if you can quite see that in the red. Let me get it nice and thick up there on the screen. Okay. And then uh, COVID hit in March, and then it did this. Woo! Boom. Okay? Pretty scary for a second. It's okay. God knows what he's doing. He all, um, uh, is perfect stewards of everything. He doesn't waste anything. So while we've been wanting to be good stewards, we haven't really panicked or any of those kind of things. And then from about uh, May, June on, it kind of righted itself a little bit like this, right? And so what we've kind of seen is kind of a, a fairly decent-sized gap between here and here. And as we've been re wrestling through this, trying to figure out what 2021 looks like, you know, a lot of folks give when they come in person. It's just kind of how it works. And I'm not going to be offensive here, but I will tell you kind of some different language. you got tippers, you got tithers, you got tillers, different people who go, hey, I really enjoyed the church service. Thanks so much. I'm pulling cash out. Really thankful that anybody would trust God with their money, trust our church with their money. And others who, you know, have automated it and keep writing the checks. Others who are doing it online. And so just a slew of different folks. But this, uh, this predictive, where we are right now versus where uh, the budget is, that's 1.5. What it certainly looks like we're going to end up with in a predicted budget for next year is about 1.15. Let me do the math for you real quick. If it's 1.15, it's supposed to be 1.5. That's $350,000 different that the budget looks like it's going to be for next year. Okay? So a lot of that is just trying to go, okay, what from March on, or April on, oh, sorry, uh, from April on right here, what is uh, good forecasting would be, pro, you know, appropriate stewardship. And as we worked through, looked at the numbers, it just seems like where we are, we can count on good forecasting in that. Uh, we probably have $1.15 million dollars. $1,150,000 million, $150,000 that we probably expect to continue to come in. Maybe it's more than that, but we go, what's a conservative estimate to make sure we're good stewards? One of the things that's really important to me, you see it throughout the scriptures. You can see what Nehemiah comes back and restores and want to challenge you with this more for your personal finance, not for the churches, is a lot of people, what they do dangerously is they leverage their future for their present. You understand? So they peer into the future and go, I'll be able to pay more then, so let me put this on credit card. Let me go into more debt. So they leverage their future, right, to bring, uh, to, to, to have whatever experience they want in the present. What we want to be careful is, is not going, let's, you know, while we want to walk in faith, we want to go, we want to reimagine 2021 with these big numbers. If we don't know what's there, we don't want to leverage the future in order to be in the present. So what it looks like that we feel like we can do pretty appropriately is have a $1.15 million budget. So that's $350,000 difference. And so what that's meant for us, we have a personnel team and elders and uh, staff and kind of wrestled through what does that mean for how we budget for next year, right? $350,000 is a pretty significant adjustment, you know, 25, 30% of our budget we're adjusting. And again, not asking any ask here, just want you to know the information. So what became um, evident is that in order to budget for a better year next year, we had to make some cuts. And what we did, a couple of different things, we kind of uh, uh, reanalyzed how we do outreach, right? Funds go into outreach and uh, don't worry, we're going to do a lot of outreach. In fact, I uh, can't wait for you to show back up here in the beginning of the year because I'm going to tell you how we're going to be working on turning NLPC into a homeless shelter in uh, partnership with Family Promise. It's going to happen, and we're going to get to partner that right here in our community. I can't wait to tell you all sorts of stuff that we have kind of envisioned for 2021 with the New London Presbyterian Church building just down the road. If you didn't know, there's a church that's met in there for several years. They bought Kimballsville United Methodist Church, so that's been empty for a while. So we've been praying, and certainly looks like that's what God's up to. So I'll tell you more about that. So there's lots of stuff we're still going to do with outreach. But as we kind of wrestle through how do we make the right decisions with budget, the places, there's just lots of fixed costs. We have a mortgage. We have utilities. There's just things that are fixed costs. We have insurance, all those things. We have uh, snow care and property care. By the way, um, when you see Jeff Pinson, he is our uh, facilities and maintenance uh, uh, buildings director. He and his team have done an incredible job of making this place safe. Every time I've showed up over the last several days, Jeff's been here, and he's been holding some piece of equipment, whether it's a tractor, a snow shovel, um, you know, a snow blower, or a big truck, 
working really hard. And so some of those things are just fixed costs to just take care and prepare. And so a little bit that can come out of kind of outreach and some mission budget. But the significant hit, guys, as we look through it, is um, actually in personnel. That was the one where we could make some cuts. And so what we did is we made the decision not to backfill some positions uh, that of uh, people that stopped working here in 2020, right? So we uh, not to backfill some positions, and we had to make some salary and benefits cuts kind of across the board. And so not telling you that because I'm looking for sympathy or anything else. I just want you to know the information since we're a church family. So that's what's been going on. And yet I'll tell you, we are incredibly, as a staff session, optimistic and excited about 2021. So this isn't woe is us. This is the Lord is up to something, and we believe wholeheartedly, you can see it in Matthew 26, Matthew 25 and 26, the parable of the talents. Whatever God has given to us, he's given us to a, for a reason. It's to be a good steward of that so that we can bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And we certainly hope he says through our church, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of, our, of his rest while we serve him. And so we think 2021 is a really good opportunity for us to enter into the joy of his that enter into his joy of rest. And I'll tell you more about rest in just a second. So just want you to know, that's the information. Got any questions? We're pretty much an open book here. Um, you can email us. You can email info at clcfamily.church. You can email me, josh at clcfamily.church. Molly, um, who's back from maternity leave, she keeps an eye on that email address uh, just so we can make sure I cover them all because I'm not the best at email correspondence. And so email me there. Or literally, you can actually just call 610-869-2140 and Joyce, our chief resource officer, would be happy to share with you what's going on, what our plans are, and what's going on with our budget. So we're a family. Just wanted you to know that. I hope you hear optimism and joy in my voice. But So this isn't, oh, I need you to do something other than pray and uh, figure out what God wants you to participate in the kingdom in whatever way that is. Just wanted you to know. So there's the picture. That's the fun. Thanks for joining with me. If you're brand new here, <laughs> this is... This is very rare for us to talk about this stuff. Now, if you have the newsletter, you'll get kind of where we are in the budget or the quarterly publication. We'll, we'll publish it, but you'll notice we don't talk much about money here. Uh, not because we shouldn't, but mainly because there's this, this stigma that the church is after your money. Listen, we do not want your money. That's the really good news. We're not after your money. Here's this. God's actually not after your money. Bad news? He wants a lot more than your money. He wants your heart. So every now and then we talk about it. This may be the first time we've really talked about it in, in a sermon or in the beginning in 2020. So this is not a normal part of kind of how it goes here. What's normal is we carve out a good bit of time to actually talk about the Bible on Sunday mornings. And what we do is we teach in what's called a series. And by that, it just means we're covering a little bit of a section of a longer, bigger section. And so we're in the series, week five, called God with us, God with us. And it comes from this idea in Isaiah chapter seven, where it tells us, actually Isaiah 7, 14, if you have the Bible app. This is your verse of the day right here. And it tells us that he will be called Emmanuel. You'll know what he'll be called Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. The craziest story of Christmas is that God, the form of Jesus, put on human flesh and entered our world. The way it tells us in John chapter 1 in the message version, Eugene Peterson says, God put on body and moved into the neighborhood. That's the, the story of the gospel. So if you don't know much about the Bible or the gospel, there's only one goal. And the goal is that you would be with Jesus forever. And so you read through the Old Testament, there's just this messiness of it. And people are wondering, is God ever going to love us again? Is he ever going to be close to us again? And then finally, as the New Testament starts, there's this, this proclamation that God is now with us. So usually Christmas series, we look at Jesus as a baby. We celebrate him in the pageantry of the baby, the shepherds, the wise men, and the virgin birth. All, all those things, which are all really significant. But the story of Christmas isn't that Jesus was born as a baby. The story of Christmas is God put on a body, moved into the neighborhood. And so what we've been doing is we've just kind of been chronicling what it looks like to actually be with God and for him to be with us in Jesus. So kind of the shorter pitch is we're in week five of a series called God with Us. But the longer thing is this is just a sub-series of a bigger series, and it's actually been going on now for 23 weeks. And what we've been doing is studying this uh, book of the Bible called the Gospel of Luke. And so Luke was a medical doctor right? So medical doctor turned investigative journalist, really neat thing, real story. This guy named Theophilus trying to figure out whether or not Jesus actually was God and God actually put on a body and Jesus was actually with us. He hires this guy, true story, to go and investigate the life 
of Jesus to see if he lived with us, see if he was actually God, see if he did all the things he said he would do, see if he actually was murdered for this statement and then came back to life, see if he actually came and redid all the rules, all that kind of stuff. So the whole story of Luke is about this guy named Jesus. And he tells us in Luke chapter 1, he writes these things that we've been studying so that we could have certainty of the things we've been taught. So for 22, 23 weeks, we've been trying to have certainty of something in a world that is pretty uncertain. So Luke gives us some certainty about the things you've been taught. So 22 weeks, five chapters. Good news, boys and girls, we are now entering chapter six of the Gospel of Luke. And so if you don't know much about the Bible, completely understand, happy to have you here with us. And so the Bible was actually written over about 15 or 1600 years, right? And it's written by at least 35, maybe 40 or plus authors. But it's one story. In fact, it's divided up into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament is all the story about God's promises, that God was promising that one day he would make everything right again, right? I told you, from the very beginning, oh, sorry, Luke, you can stay down there. I'm going to throw you there, here at the office. Come down there with him. There you go. Okay, so uh, the, the whole story, I told you from the very beginning, uh, Adam and Eve get married, they have kids, and it, everything's just a mess. But from the beginning of the story, you can read it in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 11. There is this promise that one day God would make everything right. And he would send what was called a Messiah, Jesus. So Luke is writing about the promises. And guess what? Luke's gospel in the beginning of the New Testament is all about the fulfillment of all the promises. Now here's what's really, really crazy. When we look at the fulfillment of all the promises, what we're really seeing here is that Luke is going to tell us that all the promises of the Old Testament are all fulfilled in one person, Jesus. So what we've been doing in this crazy sense is we've kind of been jumping back and forth on this timeline, like one of those shows that don't make any sense, that you have to really pay attention, and you have to use the subtitles because they jump back and forth on, on time. And even, I told you, I don't like these shows. I don't like them. Just give me one episode where the bad guy gets caught and he gets thrown in jail at the end. You follow? So... Uh, there's this episodic drama where there's a new bad guy every week. That's what I like. Start to finish, it's resolved. But there's these other shows that they never resolve, and you're always jumping back 100 years or 30 years or 20 years and jumping into the future. Well, while I don't like it, when you look at the scriptures, it's kind of the same story. In fact, Julie and I have been watching this, this uh, series on CBS called Hawaii Five-0. Some of you knew the original, and it's supposed to be one of those. This catch the bad guys each week. And now they're having all these secret stuff in the background. And so this past week, we were, or a couple nights ago, we were watching an old episode, and they jumped back to like the 1940s. And I'm just done with it. Just give me present day to solve the problem, right? But anyway, we've been kind of following the other line where we're just kind of jumping back and forth. And so we're looking at God being with us 2,000 years ago, right? But we're also looking at imagining in the future, right? So here we are in 2020. So sometimes we'll talk about God a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago and sometimes we'll be back in 2020 occasionally we'll think about something even further down the line when Jesus returns and so we just kind of been working through this timeline I'll catch you up if you're brand new here so that's what's been going on but the whole idea Old Testament is there's a promise New Testament is there's a fulfillment but here's the problem in the Old Testament a lot of people didn't understand that they needed a fulfillment right they're a lot like us they think life's okay if they have more good days than bad days. They think about things like karma. If you're good to people, they're good to you, the end, right? They operate with these really weird worldviews that just is about progress and acquisition, right? And throughout the Old Testament, people are so consumed with the, what was right there in front of them that they lost sight of a bigger picture. And so God would, throughout the Scripture, send these prophets and send these writers who would declare that there was a promise would make all things right but they couldn't get it so one of the things that god does in the old testament is he he uh, speaks to this guy named moses right uh, and he says to moses hey uh, like let me actually i was going to put moses up here uh 1500 years before jesus shows up he speaks to this guy named moses and he goes hey moses i'm gonna give it this way so i don't know what else i'm gonna have to get up there so moses hey i want you to speak to the people and tell them that there is a good god and there is a good way and one day he'll make all things right and i want you to help them understand how much they need a savior and so what God does is he gives them, you're familiar with it, the Ten Commandments, plus about 603 additional laws, and he gives them all these rules in the Old Testament. Now, what happened is uh, the people grabbed onto these rules, and they go, ooh, ooh, we'll just follow the rules. We can be good people. We'll just follow the rules. And what I tell you over and over again is that when you see the Ten Commandments or see the rules, why they are great guidelines, you will never regret obeying the law. 
Never will you ever look back and go, man, I can't believe. I hate that I actually followed God's rules. I hate that I followed God's word, right? But that is not the, the number one goal of all the rules. The way that I want you to see the rules, the Ten Commandments, all the rules is like an MRI machine. Over and over again, I'm going to keep telling you this because it's so important. When, when God gave them the, the rules, it's like an MRI machine. It was actually, they would look at it and go, oh, I can't follow all those, right? An MRI machine doesn't fix you. It doesn't save you. It doesn't heal your body. What does it do? You lay in it, and it runs this scan, makes the loud noises, and then someone gives you this revelation, this understanding that there is something wrong with your body. If there is, the MRI machine didn't fix anything for you, but what did it do? It pointed you in the direction you need to go. You need to find an expert. You need to find, you know, a, a physician who can actually bring healing to your body. So the whole point of the MRI machine is to give you some self-awareness so that you can then go seek salvation. You follow me? And so when God, in this, in this promise, has given people these rules, he's going, hey, you cannot follow all these rules. It should help you understand that you are broken and messy and cannot fix yourself. And therefore, you should look towards a fulfiller of the promise instead of looking towards yourself to be the one who fulfilled it, right? And so, but the problem is, is all the people kind of gravitated to the rules because we can control the rules, right? And so, the way that I want you to see the rules in the Old Testament, maybe perhaps you've had a dog and you've been trying to convince your dog, they're sitting around the table because they want to eat your food, but you've already given them food and it's in their bowl, right? And so they're standing there and they're just like sitting there like this and you go, hey, dog, go eat your food. There's good stuff over there. In fact, I dropped some of the fat for my steak in there. Go eat, the, go eat it, right? Now, if you have a dog, you've had this experience. As you're pointing to the bowl, what does the dog do? My dog, other dogs, they go to the finger, right? So you go look right there, and instead of going to where you're pointing, they come right here to your finger, and you're like, there is nothing on my finger. I want you to go over there, but they don't get it. They don't get that there's some trajectory that your finger has this imaginary line that's going over to some bowl that they're supposed to go to. Instead, what do they do? They go right to the finger. So if you can imagine the Old Testament, all these rules, imagine like we're the dog, and the rules are the pointing finger. They're pointing finger. They're going, hey, look over there. No, no, not here. Look over there. And what happened throughout the Old Testament is humans kept going to the finger and going, oh, oh, show us. Right? So the rules, the scriptures were all to point them to Jesus, to point them to the fulfillment of this. And yet they got so caught up in rules. So what's interesting is last week we looked at a rule called fasting. And today we're going to look at a new rule from the Old Testament, pretty interesting one, called Sabbath. Right? But before we get there, let me just talk for a second about rules. Don't you guys love these? Don't you love rules? Are y'all enjoying 2020 right now? All the rules? And they're, they're, they seem at times arbitrary, right? So there's these different rules, and they change each week, and we're not sure if we're getting meet in person, not in person. I mean, it's been this way since March. I'm just talking about as it relates to COVID. Not only are there rules, there are opinions about the rules. Right? And I promise you, if we were to take the time, we would probably be split in three or four quadrants about how people feel about mass, just in this room, or about worship gatherings, whether or not this is essential, right? Or all of these different things, just rules specific to masks. Now, we got rules about speeding. Some of you think it's a real law. I just think it's a tax on people who are in a hurry, right? We just have different opinions on that, right? Some of you like the lottery. I just think it's a tax on people who are bad at math. Right? And so there's all sorts of different rules, and we kind of look at rules in all sorts of different ways. And yet, 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 rules guide our life. And here's the thing that I've learned. We say we don't like rules, especially when I lived in Montana. Boy, did they not like rules. Don't tell us what to do. Don't tell them what to do. But here's what I've learned. It's not that they don't like rules. It's not that you and I don't like rules. We just don't like other people's rules. Right? Think about it. Like our, our kids, they don't like rules. But once they get a little bit of autonomy, what do they do? They post those rules right outside their door. You build the treehouse or the fort. What's the first thing you do? No girls, no boys allowed, right? So it's not that we don't like rules. We just don't like other people's rules. But have you actually thought about why we have rules? What do you think about for a second? Maybe if you're online or uh, out in the car, you, you can do this a little better than we can in here. Maybe you can actually ask the question to the people around you, your kids, what they think about rules. Like, Right? Why do we have rules? And here's what's so <laughs> funny is when I grew up, I didn't like the answers to the why do I have to do that? You ready? Because I told you to. Because I said so. And you're going, what? 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 Like, 
that seems so broken. Like, how in the world can one person explain to me that the reason I should follow the rules is because they said so? That doesn't make any sense. And then 30 years later, what do I do? Know that I can see and want kids and people to act a certain way. I can go, oh, because I said so. Right? Can't you just honor your mother and father? Because the Bible says so. you got all these rules. And so I just go, do you got some rules in your life? How do you feel about them? And why do you have those rules? I bet there's a couple of reasons. One, because we find security and comfort in rules. Right? And a lot of times, I mean, not us, other people, they're just ignorant and unaware. Right? And they're not going to do the right thing. And the only way they're going to do the right thing is if we or someone tells them to do the right thing. Right? Hence masks speed limits right there's this this idea that someone who is smarter more capable more capable more aware knows how to establish the right rules and the rest of us minions we follow them just follow the rules just follow the rules and when you think about all the rules and all the complications it creates some real emotion in you maybe about people who don't follow them or maybe about the people who set them but rules are a big issue in our life so i just go what are the rules you follow and here's the better question Whose rules are they? Have you ever thought about that? Whose rules are they? So, majority of our rules, majority of our laws, all kind of are established in this Judeo-Christian worldview. Like, why shouldn't you kill someone? Why does it matter? If we're all just bags of chemicals, we don't have, like, if that's all we are, why does it matter if one person lives and another person doesn't, right? And we can trace all these things back, and we can trace them all the way back to the Old Testament. We can trace them all back to the promises. We can trace them all back to this understanding that God gives us rules to give us awareness of how bad we are at actually following them. But we don't understand that. So what do we do? We create more rules about the rules. So last week we looked at the rule of fasting and introduced you to a couple of people that have been kind of showing up for a while in the scriptures, and some of them are Pharisees. And some of our scribes, these are religious people. These are lawyers of the rules of the Bible, right? And so the scribes are the ones who are writing down all these rules. And they knew them so well, they kind of were seen as the authority on the rules and the law. And the Pharisees are the ones who kind of sat underneath um, these translations of the rules and law. So you almost see the scribes like the Supreme Court justices, right? They understand the rules and laws. And the rest of us have to find which one of those we liked or, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, interpretation. You got literalists. You got originalists. You got people who go, no, there's an evolution of it, right? And so these scribes would all view it in different ways, and the Pharisees would kind of fall under it. But Jesus is going to show up and start inviting people into partnership with him, into his presence with him. And they're not going to like it because it's going to seem a lot like he's going to disrespect the rules. You don't disrespect the rules, particularly if you're one of the ones who is responsible for making the rules, or, and, you know, and, and and making sure that they're, they're followed well. And so the scribes and Pharisees and Jesus were kind of at war in this. And so I introduced you to a word last week. You're aware of it as it relates to rules. And it's this rule, this word legalism. Legalism is this way by legally you earn your merit or your value. By what? By following the rules. So I told you one of the problems with legalism is what you do with it, you turn something that Jesus says or God says you may do, you turn a may into a must right or on the other side something uh, we take uh, legalism and go just because you shouldn't do it right doesn't mean they can't so i shouldn't therefore you can't and so these lawyers these religious leaders were all about their rules and enforcing the rules and following the rules and jesus shows up and they're going we have some new rules about fasting you should fast twice a week and jesus is going the only time throughout the scriptures are mandated fasting is actually at yom kippur so we guys saw one rule, and we saw all kind of this tension of people who wanted to follow the rules. You go, why do you want to follow them? And whose rules are they anyway? And so today we're going to see another one, and it's going to be on Sabbath. You know, Sabbath is about taking a break and entering into God's rest. So Jesus is going to break the Sabbath. They're going to pull out not only the Bible, they're going to pull out some, some rabbinical laws, 39 of them to be exact. And they're going to walk through them and go, see, Jesus, you're wrong here. But before we do that, before we get into Luke chapter 6, verse 1, let me just give you a quick... Um, overview of Sabbath, and instead of me taking a lot of time talking to you, I'm using a a neat little short video by the Gospel Project on Sabbath. So here you go. Enjoy uh, the story of Sabbath. The number seven is a big deal in the Bible. Yeah, in biblical Hebrew, the word seven is connected to the idea of fullness or completeness. And that's something we all long for, but don't often experience. Instead, we find ourselves working endlessly, fighting back chaos, with no real rest. Yes, 
Now keep all that in mind as we turn to Genesis 1 in the Bible. It begins with darkness and disorder, but then God speaks to bring about light and order so that life can flourish. And this happens over the course of six days. Each day is marked with the phrase, there was evening and there was morning. But on the seventh day, something special happens. God stops and rests. Right. Creation is brought to its completion on the seventh day. And that phrase, there was evening and there was morning, it doesn't appear on day seven. It's like a day with no end. On the seventh day, God's presence fills his creation. The land provides for all of God's creatures, including humans, who are appointed to rule the world with God forever. Kings and queens of the seventh day rest. I can get into that. But the humans are deceived by a dark power and they forfeit that rest. They're exiled into the wilderness where they have to work as slaves to the land. Until they die and return to the dust from which they came. But God wants to restore humanity back to that seventh day rest. So he chooses to give the family of Israel that experience of ultimate rest so they can share it with others. But how? They're in Egypt, slaves to an oppressive empire who's grinding them into the dust. So God confronts Egypt and he liberates the Israelites, taking them through the darkness and chaos on the way to the promised land. Now, while they're on their way, they find themselves in the wilderness. It's easy to get lost. Life is a struggle. They're not in the land of rest yet. But while they're on the way, God invites them in the wilderness to start living as if they're in the promised land. But how do you practice the future rest in the wilderness? Well, God tells them that every seventh day, they are to stop their work, or in Hebrew, to Shabbat, so that they can rest and enjoy God's good world. So take a whole day to live as if the ultimate rest has already come. Yeah, this is the Sabbath, celebrated every week on the seventh day. But there's more. The Sabbath is just one of seven festivals that Israel practiced every year, each one anticipating that seventh day rest. That is a lot of sevens. And there's even more. Every seven years, the Israelites were to liberate slaves, forgive debts, and let the land rest for a whole year. And then every seven times seven years was the ultimate seventh day rest called the year of Jubilee. If anyone had lost their land or gone into debt, all was forgiven everything restored. Wow, so the Sabbath, these feasts, the year of Jubilee, it's all pointing towards the hope of future rest. Right. Now, when the Israelites went into the land, they forgot their God, and so they forfeited their chance for rest in the promised land. They're exiled and enslaved again by an oppressive nation, led back into a world of chaos and disorder. But Israel's prophets said that their exile would end one day and that the ultimate Jubilee of freedom and rest would come but generations go by and they're still waiting. It's at this dark point in the story that Jesus appears and he launches his public mission on a Sabbath day. Yeah, he read aloud from the scroll of Isaiah saying that it was time for all captives and slaves to be released because this was the year of the Lord's favor. What did he mean, this is the year of the Lord's favor? He was talking about the ultimate Jubilee. Also, Jesus is claiming that seventh day rest would come through him. Right, he said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath and he confronted disorder and darkness and all of its forms, liberating people from sickness, sin, even from death itself. Yet, Jesus was killed, so even his work was undone. Well, it seemed that way. But notice, Jesus timed his death to take place at the end of the week. His body rested in a tomb during the Sabbath and on the eighth day, he rose from the dead. Oh wait, the eighth day? You mean the first day of a new week? Exactly. Jesus' resurrection was like the first day of a new creation, where God's light and life broke into the darkness. So because of the resurrection, we have hope in God's promise of future rest. But we're not there yet. It's like we're still in the wilderness, where we experience struggle and pain. But as we journey towards that ultimate seventh day, Jesus invites us to experience a taste of real rest now by following him, or in his words, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So they got an overview of Sabbath. So the goal of Sabbath was to be with Jesus in his rest. You got it? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, knew what he was doing on day seven. He shows us what it's like to sit 
and rest. Remember I told you, the whole goal of the gospel is so that you would be with Jesus forever. In other words, the greatest gift of Christmas is that God gives us his presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, in Jesus, and we get to enjoy his presence, and we get to participate in partnership while being in his presence. Remember, the whole goal of the rule of Sabbath is to point to our perfect hope in Jesus, that one day all that will be whole and perfect. Now, again, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't understand that. They're like, no, this is the rule. And so what's going to happen is Jesus is going to do something that he shouldn't, according to them, on Sabbath. And there's going to be a dispute. Let's read it. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. On a Sabbath, while he was going to the grain fields, he is Jesus, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on Sabbath? The Sabbath. So now we see the predicament. It's the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Jesus and his disciples are walking. You're allowed to walk. And they are hungry, so they come across the grain field, and they actually pull the grain out. They rub it together, and they eat it. They're hungry. This is a lot like you walking by an orchard and going, I'm hungry. I'm going to grab an apple, right? Some of you do that at Melbourne. Shame on you. There's cameras everywhere. I actually think they allow you to do one, just not two. If you do two, you get kicked out and, so, and thrown in jail. And so that's a joke. Uh, but anyway, so you have Jesus and his disciples. He's walking, and all of a sudden, these Pharisees, right? These Pharisees and these scribes, they're there, and they see it. This is three straight weeks the Pharisees and scribes show up. And they're going to point out that that is not following the rules. And not only is it not following the rules, they're saying it's unlawful, meaning there is a legal consequence for the behavior. So what are they talking about? Are they talking about the fact that Jesus and his disciples are stealing from someone's farmland? Nope, not at all. In fact, in Deuteronomy 23, this is so neat. Even in God's nations, in his setup of understanding that there's going to be hunger and pain and sorrow, what God kind of establishes going, if you're hungry, you can walk over to some farmland and grab enough food for the day to eat. It's actually perfectly legal and allowed. You could walk on someone's property and grab a little bit of food. Now, you couldn't, you know, bring in your big harvester tractors and grab it all. But you can get enough food to meet your day. And guess what? If you're hungry the next day, guess what you can do again? You can do that again. You can walk down, walk down the road, and you can see a field, and you can grab it, and you can eat. So this is perfectly legal, perfectly legal in terms of the Old Testament law. Remember, God gave us lots of laws. It's perfectly legal. There's nothing unlawful. So what are they talking about when they say it is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, uh, if you were to uh, understand Jewish culture, you have the biblical laws, you know, Ten Commandments, 600 plus more, right? All those laws. And then there was something uh, that they were like, well, it's kind of hard to interpret that. We need to make sure we get some really clear boundaries on how people should follow these rules. So you got these rules like, you know, honor the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, day is holy, right? Those kind of things. Mandate from God to enter into his rest, enjoy his rest, see a future picture of what it's like to rest with him forever, both in the promised land and then for all eternity, right? So but they're going, well, how do we actually help people do that? So the, the rabbis... Jewish leaders got together and they go, we need to offer some more policies and procedures around how you follow the Sabbath. I am not making this up. And they uh, came up with the 39 rules of uh, Malachot. I said it fast and like I was getting something out of my throat because that's about what it sounds like. And so that word, right? And this word comes from the Malachot that which literally means work, okay? But not any kind of work. This kind of work means to create, like creating. And so what happened is these Jewish leaders had this book, I'm not making this up, of 39 additional laws. The reason there's 39 laws and not 40, you, if you look into the New Testament, even when Romans would beat, uh, beat Jesus, beat Paul, what they would say is 40 lashes minus one. Follow, familiar with that, 39 lashes? The reason being is 40 seemed harsh. So nice. Ah, let's just subtract one. It's less harsh, right? And so the, the, even these religious leaders understood that this is a lot of rules to keep. We can't do 40, but 39 is less harsh. So these 39 rules. And what they did is they went back to the Old Testament and thought about this word of creation in the Old Testament, right? Jesus, God created, then he rested. So how do we create and make sure we don't create one day a week? And so what they went through is they went through what was going on during the time of Moses and before the time of David. We see this a little bit of David, but he's going to build the, the temple, or his son is. But before this, there's this place called the tabernacle. And there's this place that was built to house God's presence. Remember, the goal of the gospel is you and I can be with God forever in his presence. In the Old Testament, that was a promise, not a fulfillment yet. And so the way that they were reminded of that promise is God dwelled in this, what's called a tabernacle, 
a tent. And in order to build the tent, there were lots and lots of things you had to do that you'd have to put together. So they went through and followed those instructions on the creation of the tabernacle and then looked at other ways by pe- which people worked, writing, meeting, talking, all those things. And they put together these rules. I'm not making this up. Let me read them to you. 39 of them. You ready? Planting, plowing, reaping, gathering, threshing, winnowing, sorting, grinding, sifting, kneading, Cooking, shearing, scoring, uh, carding, uh, uh, dyeing, spinning, warping, threading, weaving, separating, tying, or untying. Uh oh, it's a good thing you wear sandals. Uh, sewing, tearing, trapping, slaughtering, skinning, preserving, sanding, scoring, cutting to a size, riding, <laughs> erasing, building, demolition, extinguishing, igniting, striking with a hammer, transferring between domains, right? All those things completely unallowed on the Sabbath. So Jesus and his buddies, they're walking down and they definitely are reaping and gathering and preparing. He even tells us they're rubbing their hands together. And they're going, oh, that's preparing, can't do that. And by the way, it doesn't even say Jesus is doing this. We just see that his disciples are. And so they confront Jesus and go, how dare you do that because it's unlawful. So let's see how Jesus responds to his buddies Breaking the rules, and it's so important. Stay with me, it's so good. Verse 3, and Jesus answered them. So he's going to respond. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the present, which is not lawful for for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. Okay, this is right can't be a new bad guy every week here's what jesus is doing he's talking to these guys pharisees and the scribes right he's talking to them and he's going hey have you not read what david did so let's go back here to david that's about a thousand years earlier okay and david on a day had to his followers and he was fleeing because he hasn't become king yet but saul the bad king knows one day he's going to be the king and the best way to stop him from being the king is to just murder him So Saul, the bad king, is chasing after David. David is exhausted. He doesn't have any food with him. Him and his his followers, his his men, are running, and they are starving. And they're going, David, we're so hungry. And so what happened is David stumbles upon the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle, I told you a little earlier. So a thousand years here, 500 years earlier, there is these rules established in the tabernacle. So this is 1 Samuel 21. But if you go back to Exodus chapter 25, when you look at the tabernacle, there was this really neat thing that God did. God looked at the nation of Israel, 12 nations, and he says, I want you to remember in the tabernacle that the whole goal of my promise is that one day you and I will be together. Our presence will be together. This is so profound that all this is going on. This is what Jesus is talking about. That's why we've got to use the timeline, right? So he's talking about something that happened a thousand years earlier, but a rule and a law from 1,500 years earlier, right? So he goes, hey, so what God established, he says, I want you to do is I want you to put these beautiful created tasty pieces of bread together in the tabernacle and i want them to be fresh every single week every single week i want you to place 12 pieces of bread in the tabernacle and literally it was called show bread which was bread of faith meaning this beautiful thing and he said the reason i want you to do it is so that you can understand the whole goal of all this is for you and i to table together and i told you about tabling the whole goal of this is that I want my people to be with me and eat with me. And yet, the fulfillment of the promise of how you're going to be able to do that hasn't happened yet. So every single week, I want you to create new bread, and I want you to put it in the tabernacle as a reminder that the goal of all this is one day you and I will be together forever, and you will get to enjoy, enjoy my presence and eat with me. Right, you see, what we can imagine, it says in Genesis chapter 3, God walked in the garden in the cool of the night, so I could just argue that God was eating with his people before the mess happened. And then what happens is uh, Adam and Eve kind of get dismissed from the table. And we understand in Revelation chapter 3 where God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will enter or let me enter, I will come in and I will dine with them. So the whole Old Testament, 1,500 years earlier, was pointing to this moment that's going to happen when Jesus returns and we're going to get to eat together. So he's going to, in preparation that. So you'll be reminded every single week, I want you to make your best bread and I want you to prepare the table. Because one day all this is going to be great. You're going to enter into my rest. And then every single week, what happened on the last day, they would, uh, the, the priests would eat the bread. Really nice. But it was the stale bread. And they'd create new bread to go, no, no. This relationship with God is not stale. It is perfect. And it is fresh. 
It's about friendship and it's about fellowship. So these 12 cakes of bread were placed before them with fellowship that was fresh and it was replaced every single Sabbath. So, skip ahead. On uh, the day of the Sabbath, before it's been refreshed, more than likely, David and his disciples are running through and they're going, we're hungry. And so they go in and they're going, look, my men are hungry. The king's going to kill us. Can we eat the bread? And they're going, hey, have you slept with anybody lately? And they're like, nope, nope, we've been by ourselves. They're like, okay, you can eat. Really, that's how it plays out in the scriptures. And they sit and they eat and they're nourished. And guess what? They weren't supposed to do that. They weren't supposed to eat that bread on that day. That was guarded bread, that there was this process of sanctification that would have to happen before it happened. So these Pharisees and scribes, boy, do they love David. David's their king, right? He's, he's the guy who gave them the temple. I mean, his son did, Solomon, but he's the one who envisioned it. He was the guy that everyone knew was a man after God's own heart. I mean, they love David. And so Jesus is going, you know what's interesting? We're not even doing anything unlawful. We're not even doing anything that, that's unbiblical. You're going to bring up your 39 laws and point out to them. But those are, those are rabbinical laws, not biblical laws. We're never doing anything wrong. But you know what? There was a guy, your boy. Maybe he did something wrong. Maybe he didn't follow the rules correctly. You're not complaining about him. So why are you so judgmental towards me and my people, but allow this in the Old Testament? Allow this with your great hero. So he's pointing it out and going, why are you okay with that? Why are you not concerned about those rules? Why are you just concerned about this rule? Right? Why are you just trying to be upset with me? Why is that the case? Until so you look at it and you go, well, what's he talking about? Now, I'll just tell you, what, what, what had happened here is these guys had already made up their decision about Jesus. So what do you do when you've already made up your mind? What do you do when you've already decided you're going to buy the car? What do you do when you already decided you're going to leave the job? You know what, ha notice what happens then? What do, you decide, what do you do when you decide you're going to break up with the boy or girl? What, you know what happens? Now all your view is now gathering data that confirms your decision that you've already made. All of it. So Jesus is going, you've already gathered the data that confirms this. You don't want me. You don't want me to be the Messiah. You like your rules. You don't want to look and think that maybe the finger of the rules is pointing to me. You just want to stare at the finger. Because in the fingers, you've got control, right? You can do these things. So they have just gone ahead and made up their decision about Jesus. And I would go, that's one of my biggest fears for us in this Christmas season is many of us have already decided what we believe about Jesus. We've already decided how we are going to interact with Jesus. We've already decided what role we think Jesus is going to play in our life. And let me just speak candidly here. That role typically is some kind of covering of fire insurance so that one day you can go to heaven. And not that today... You get to enter into his presence and his rest. Right? I mean, that's what's available. And they're going, you know, Jesus is going, you're, you're saying we should Sabbath so that we could enter into his rest. Do you not understand to enter into the rest means to enter into my presence? Here I am, and you've just made up your mind about it, so you're now going and gathering all the rules and all the, the, the data to point that you're right instead of being curious about what if the God of the universe is right here in front of you? Like for us right now, what if the God of the universe is sitting in your living room and you're so caught up in the, going to the pageantry and the moment by moment going, okay, we just got to get through the service, got to sing the songs and go home. We got to empty our sin bucket. What if we're trying to enter into his presence by following all the rules and not even looking up and going, no, he is already here with us. So Jesus is going, you're doing all this stuff and you didn't do it to David because he fits your viewpoint that you can behave a certain way and do certain things and somehow God will like you more if you follow the rules. You can follow your legalese. And then Jesus says something so profound. Verse 5, and it says this. And he said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of Sabbath. And he said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of Sabbath. So again, we, if you can go back a couple weeks and see this, when Jesus has made this declaration before, he's actually pointed to something that's happening in Daniel, where what, there's this promise that's going to be fulfilled that one day there will be someone like us, but not like us. He'll be like human. He'll, that son of man points to Jesus' humanity that will do it right. All of us don't follow the rules. Hopefully all these rules are revealed to us that we can't follow them, but there's one who can follow them all and do it all perfectly. He goes, the son of man, watch this, is Lord of the Sabbath. Here's what he's saying. Okay? Hear me. Most important part of this, but we're going to see another really neat story right after this. He's saying this. You should not find your comfort in the rules. You should not find your security in the rules. You should not find 
your control in the rules. That's the Sabbath. You know what you should do? You should find your comfort in the one who rules. You should find your security in the one who rules. Right? You should find all your comfort and joy and peace and rest, not in the rule, but in the one who rules. He's going, no, no, look, you're thinking the Sabbath is the, the, the end. No, the Sabbath is a means to the end, and the end is actually me. I am the Lord, the Son of Man, is the boss of the Sabbath. Don't look at the rules. Don't get caught up in the rules. Don't just follow the rules. Follow the one who rules. So Jesus is spinning this going, look at these disciples. You're mad because they're eating a little bit of grain. You know why they're hungry? Because they've been following the one who rules. You know why they don't have anything? Because they haven't been finding their security and their comfort and what they can acquire. The way you do with your rules. They're finding their comfort and security in the one who rules. So of course they're going to eat this in this moment. Because they are attached to me. They, are inter- they have entered into my rest and presence. So that's how he finishes it and goes, don't find your comfort in the rules. Find your comfort in the one who rules. I am Lord of the Sabbath. And so Luke wants to kind of beat this into your head, beat it into mind, make sure we understand it. So he's going to talk about a different Sabbath. Verse 6, it says this. On another Sabbath, that's at least seven days away. You follow? Uh, he entered, that's Jesus again, the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. Okay, I've already put him up here. So you got this man, that's his withered hand. Jesus is entering. This is where these kind of intersects. So the Pharisees, scribes, they're still there. Jesus, next one, Luke's going, if they don't get it about the Sabbath, let's get it about this, because this is another one of the rules that he's going to break on the Sabbath. He's going to perform a miracle on the Sabbath. Now, just so you understand, you're allowed to perform a miracle on the Sabbath if it's life and death. But this man's not going to die. His life just is in pain and sorrow. But that doesn't matter, right? It's just about life or death. So they're kind of parsing the rules. And so it says this. And he entered the synagogue, and there's a man whose hand was withered. Now, like I told you, these Pharisees and scribes, like us, have already made up our decision about Jesus. They've already made up their mind about what should be done and what shouldn't be done. They've already created their expectations of how Jesus should perform. Right? You've gotten that. You've done that. You've prayed the prayer and expect Jesus to be your new genie in a bottle. So they expect Jesus to teach and do those things and, you know, tickle their fancy, do some neat stuff. But he better follow their rules. Verse 7. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. So they might find a reason to accuse him. You see this? They've already made up their mind about who Jesus is. They are looking for a reason to throw Jesus out. They're looking for any reason to prove that Jesus is not Messiah. You look at our world, so much energy and time is spent trying to come up with a reason not to follow Jesus. These guys are with Jesus. He is in their presence, but they're so consumed with their preconceived notion. They're so consumed with staring at the finger pointing that they can't see where the finger is pointing. So they're looking to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. Of course he did. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. So he knows that the scribes and the Pharisees are watching the scene. There's this collision. God's faithfulness is about to collide with this man's faith. And here they are together. And the Pharisees and scribes are watching, ready to get him caught in not following the rules. Maybe this is the time he gets thrown in jail. Maybe this is the time he gets kicked out of the, the, the synagogue. Maybe this is the time. So they are waiting. But they've already made up their mind about what Jesus is going to do. They've already made up their mind. So Jesus is about to perform a miracle. And he's not allowed to based on the 39 rules. Because this is not urgent. This is not someone who's going to die. And I just need you to see this and hear this. While it wasn't urgent for these Pharisees and scribes, and it wasn't life or death for this man, you see what Jesus does here? He pauses in the middle of this. Because while it's not life and death, I can promise you it was really urgent for this man. This is so important for you to get. Because so many of us think, well, no, why would God respond to that? I mean, it's not as urgent as the impoverished kids. Well, why would God meet me here, care about my marriage, or care about my family when there are people dying in the Middle East? You see, God is omnipresent, omniscient. He is capable of handling both at all times. So the story of this that I want you to see is that these things that might seem like minutia to others, no, this, is not, this, doesn't, this goes against the rules. This isn't life or death for Jesus because he loves this man. It mattered immeasurably to him. 
So what that means is whatever you're walking in here with, whatever you have on this day, which we think of as the Sabbath. So just so you understand, the Sabbath was the last day of the week. But one of the things transitioned with the resurrection is the church started worshiping on the first day of the week, the, the Lord's Day, because that's the day Jesus rose. Right? You just heard about it. It's so amazing that God literally died on the sa- like as the Sabbath was beginning, on the end of the day. And then he came back on the brand new day of life, right? Ushered in all creation. So what happened here, what we see is what's changed for the Americans and for the, the church across the globe, and there's some others that still celebrate on the, sa- uh, on the last day of the week, is that we worship on the first day. The Lord's Day is the day that we celebrate this. Now, what happened in the 1800s, 1800s even with Henry Ford and 1900s, you got this thing, they're going, okay, which days do we take off? And Because there's Jews who worship on the Sabbath, and then there's Christians who worship on the Sunday, hence you get the weekend. So, yay, Judeo-Christian values, that's how you got a Saturday and Sunday. And so, in this moment, what I want you to hear more than anything is you are with God on the Lord's day and whatever you have that's bothering you, he cares about. And whatever you have that's bothering you, Jesus can actually do something about. He's not looking for you to follow some more rules or do some more neat stuff. He is the Lord of the rules. Don't follow the rules, follow the one who rules. So he's going to meet this guy with his withered hand right here. And I would argue, please, please, please don't be like the Pharisees. Don't just assume you know what Jesus wants to do today. Don't just assume that today isn't the day that he doesn't want to meet with you or respond to you or care about you or usher you into his presence. So he knows their thoughts. He tells them to stand in verse 9. It says this. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or destroy it? So what he's about to do, it's really, really important because they were so caught up in the rules, and he's now going to give them a new rule to follow. And I'm going to give it to you as well, okay? He's going to go, okay, let's talk about this. Tell me what's lawful. Is it lawful to save life or destroy it? Do you see what he does here? He turns everything into a binary decision. This is so profound. He's not like, you know, you got all these laws, you got all this gray area. Well, I'm not sure if I should, I'm not sure if I should. And he said, it's really, really, it's really this simple. And the way that you respond on the Sabbath and any other day, the way that I respond to people is one of two things, right? All of us, at all times, we're doing one of two things. We're either saving life or destroying it. John Maxwell, one of my heroes, I actually wanted to name Briggs Max, but Julie said it sounded like a dog's name, so if you name your kid Max, no judgment from you, but my wife's probably judging you for it. But, so that's why we actually have a Max as a dog, because I couldn't name Briggs Max, and the reason I wanted to name Max was for Maxwell, which is John Maxwell, one of my heroes in ministry and leadership. One of the things that John Maxwell says, and he's wrong, is he says that um, all leadership's about adding value. He's close. Adding value, by the way you do that, is by appreciation. That's literally what the word means. But the flaw in that, and I'm not saying, I mean, he's accurate on this. The flaw in it is assuming that somehow we can increase the value of someone. But you can't. Because God of the universe, when he spoke us into existence, when he imagined us before the foundation of those, he saw you with a measurable value, right? We know this. The va- value of something is what someone is willing to pay for it. The God of the universe gave his life for each of us, meaning you are so valuable that the God of the universe paid his life for you. What that means is every single person we interact with, that's even your enemies, every single person you, we interact with has a measurable value. So when he's saying, do you want to save a life or destroy it? The way that I would offer it is this. Do you want to cover up value or you want to uncover it? There is no middle ground. In every single interaction, if you're a Christian, I want you to hear this. In every single interaction, with the God of the universe being in you, the Holy Spirit leading you, in every single interaction, it is binary. There is no medium. There is no middle. We are either covering up value by the way we discount someone, the way we don't give them dignity, the way we don't make eye contact with them, the way we move right past them, or we're uncovering value. That means in every interaction you have with a customer service representative on the phone, you're either uncovering value or or covering it up. Every time you go into a store, the person in front of you is going too slow, the cashier who's talking too much, in every single interaction. He's saying this. You got all these rules. You got all these rules, but this really is pretty simple. Does it make sense that you'd save a life or destroy it? So as we sort through Christmas, we have a response to go, in my interactions, am I uncovering value or am I covering it up? It is that binary. And so he asks them the question. And see an answer, and it says, and after looking around them, all he, at them all, he said to them, 
said to him, stretch out your hand. So this man's here. He looks around and says, do you want me to uncover value or, co- uh, or cover it up? Do you want me to save a life or destroy it? And he looks at this man. And he says, stretch out your hand. This man goes, my hand doesn't stretch. And you see this man in faith for the first time. He stretches out his hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. Boy, do I know what that's like, guys. Uh, about 14 months ago, uh, yeah, 15 months ago, I did some nerve damage, neuropathy, down my leg, tons of pain, and I, I had this brace that literally uh, killed uh, nerve to the point where I, you, you've seen me probably walk like a Clydesdale, right? And I, I couldn't move my foot. Hold it. Like, it was just, it just hung like this. Every time I walked on something, I tripped. I had to get this brace that would spring it up. And, I mean, bad pain going throughout my back. Literally, every night I'd try to lift it. You know, your, your brain is just telling you to do something, and it just won't do it. It makes no sense. And so, uh, about last, this past April or May, I decided, you know, I'm going to take off the brace. I don't know what's going on. I'll, hopefully, it'll regenerate and just stop wearing it. And hey, I just was, I've been going, you know what? I haven't, <laughs> I haven't really tripped over anything in a while. I wonder if I can just, my brain can tell my toes to lift. <laughs> and in a moment, I just go, to hey, lift and look down and. My toe, it lifts. I don't know if it happened, kind of, in an instant. I don't know if it kind of happened. I didn't think about it in terms of regeneration. But I know what it's like to have your mind tell your body to do something and not work. And I know many of you have that same experience. This is a guy whose mind can tell his hand to work and it wouldn't. But Jesus goes and tells him, lift it. He doesn't go, no, 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 Jesus, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. These people are watching. Can we do this in private? Can we do it somewhere else? All we know is in that moment, he obeyed. And his hand was restored. Why don't you see this? Verse 11. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Two things I want to point out. The first one is the reason this man gets healed is because he came into the presence of Jesus and he obeyed what he said. Want healing in your life? Two things have to happen. One, you have to come into his presence. How do you do that? Well, luckily, God is everywhere at all times. One thing Jesus says is, good that I'm going back to be with the Father, because if I go back and be with the Father, then my spirit will come and be with you. And the spirit's described like when, meaning it just moves as it moves, when it moves. And while you might not be able to see it, boy, can you see the effects of it, right? You know this. And so that, that, that means the presence of the mighty living God is available to you at all times. He's willing and he's active. He is speaking. But we have to listen. And this gets weird because, you know, no, I've tried that before. It doesn't really work. And this is where I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid that we will just start go ahead and make up our mind about what Jesus wants to do this Christmas season because he didn't do it last year or the year before. What if this is your moment that he's telling you to, to stretch out your hand? What if it is? And I can't make that happen for you. I can't even convince you. But, but there comes a moment at some point where you have to enter into his presence. Why the Sabbath is so important. So that you can hear from God and do what he says. The whole life of a Christian is just defined by those two things. Hearing from God and doing what he says. If we miss that, if we miss being in his presence, hearing from him and responding, then we have lost the whole, all side of what it means to be a Christian. Enter his presence, receive from him, and do what he says. You go, well, I've never heard his voice audibly. That's okay, neither have I. But he's written, using nearly 40 authors over 1,600 years, the story of his heart for you and the commands that he's called us to. So what if? God actually wants to speak to you. Enter into his presence. Is your heart ready for that? There's a really easy way to tell. See what happens in verse 11? It says these Pharisees, the rulers of the law, literally says, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. So the band's going to come up here, and I just want to challenge you with that. How do you respond when good things happen to other people? How, about, how do you respond when good things happen to your enemy? How do you respond when good just happens to your ex? Like, how do you respond when we experience all the common grace that's offered us? How do you respond when good happens to someone else and not you? How do you respond in that? If, if, if your response to good across this world isn't anger or sadness, what if someone today were to go, today's the day I stretched out my hand? How do you respond? You go, well, I didn't get to do that. Or do you go, I just saw the evidence of the Spirit of the living God on someone. Like, how do you respond to that? If you respond with joy and hope, then what that means is you're so thrilled that God is uncovering value in people because there's no middle ground. So we get to check our hearts and go, boy, God, I'd love to hear from you. 
and do what you say. One of the things that God's been challenging me on a whole bunch is, boy, do I want to see him move. And what God's asking me is, Josh, would you be just as excited for him to move in the church down the street as you want him to move in CLC? And boy, have I had to wrestle with that going, well, God, I'd really like to be used. I'd like for you to use our church. But the spirit of the living God does not sit underneath a steeple and hate building. The spirit of the living God moves how it moves and the way that it moves, and our goal is just to hear from him and respond. So can we look in all the places where God seems to be at work across the globe and across our family and across the universe and across our city, and in every single time we see when God's at work, can we celebrate it? If we can get there, if we can get there, then we're in a spot where we have the same heart as God has. And so we're going to sing this song that talks about the way by which we respond as we adore Jesus. It starts by entering his presence. But the song is really, really beautiful because it doesn't just talk about us adoring Jesus. It's a reminder that this message of hope and joy this Christmas season is not just for us, but it's for the entire world. And so there's some real specific lyrics that point out the people that Jesus came to offer his love, to invite him, to adore him. And I promise you, as you read these lyrics, you'll recognize that you fit in with the crowd that gets to come in and be with Jesus. So the band's going to lead us, and we're going to sing a song together as we close. So would you stand with me as we sing? Savior, come let us a 
King has come, and that is what we get to celebrate this week. That is what we get to proclaim, and so thanks for singing along and worshiping with us this, this morning. I do want to give you guys just a couple reminders. We get to celebrate that this Thursday at our Christmas Eve services, and so we invite you. Uh, bring a friend, bring family, come join us. It's going to be a wonderful celebration of what has happened and what is to come, and you can tune in once again online. And then another reminder, don't show up here next week. We will not be here, but please tune in online. We would love to have you join us in our online service. Uh, let me send you all off with this benediction this morning. Let us go from this place proclaiming that we have seen the glory of God, believing that there is a light that shines in the darkness, which the darkness shall not overcome. And may the love of the Creator, the joy of the Spirit, and the peace of the Christ child be with you this Christmas and evermore. Amen. We love you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us, and we will see you soon.